You're listening to The Culture Report, voice of Russia, America's weekly look into the world of arts, culture, and history. I'm Rob Sachs. This month, a retired Soviet colonel received the prestigious Dresden Prize and an award of 25,000 euros for doing nothing and, in the end, saving the free world from nuclear annihilation. In 1983, Stanislav Petrov was commanding a remote command center of the Soviet nuclear early warning system outside Moscow, and a message appeared that five nuclear missiles had been launched from the United States. Protocol demanded that he instantly launch a counterattack, but Petrov did not recognize the attack for what it was, a computer glitch. For that, he is recognized as one of the unsung heroes of the Cold War. We wanted to talk more about this incident and what tensions were like back in 1983, so we've called Bill Yenny. He's an historian who's written numerous books on 20th century history, including Secret Weapons of the Cold War, From the H-Bomb to SDI. His latest book is The White Rose of Stalingrad. Bill Yenny, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Let's go back to this incident in 1983. And, you know, people joked about uh, there being a button right underneath Reagan or Gorbachev or whatever, and at any point they could just push this button and boom, the nukes get launched. Was it really that close uh, by that one person had their finger on a button and can instantly launch a missile? Well, the uh, uh, as, as we called it in the United States, the National Command Authority, which ends the top of that chain of command, is the president who could uh, authorize the nuclear go code to launch uh, missiles in retaliation against a Soviet launch. So that uh, there was a button. Yes, there was a, not a literal button, but an authorization capability to uh, tell the people who did have the buttons to go ahead and push them. But there was numerous layers of, uh, of fail-safe and chain of command and people who were asking the people below them and above them, are you sure? And by the time it reached the president, numerous people would have been asked, are you sure, and answered yes. I assume that uh, that in Petra's chain of command, there were people who uh, he, would have, he would have checked with. And um, we had always assumed that the system in the Soviet uh, Union was similar to or the same as in the United States, that uh, launches couldn't take place without... Uh, authorization from uh, the highest authorities. Well, to, to be clear, his duty was to report the missiles, which would have likely have then, you know, set the dominoes in motion. So, you know, he he wouldn't necessarily hit the the button, but he stopped it before it got any further, which is, you know, an, an important part of it. He he was the one who made sure that this was a malfunction and not the real thing. And it seems like, you know, in 1983 as well, I remember the uh, the movie War Games, Matthew Broderick, and the idea uh, that a, a computer glitch, uh, or in, in this movie a rogue computer or whatever, uh, could actually get two countries warring against each other. Theoretically, it's, it's possible, but it, it's certainly uh, possible that it could have gotten the ball rolling. There was another incident on the other side in 1979, which is called the training tape incident, in which a... Um, uh, a training tape was was mistakenly um, plugged into the system, and it yielded a false positive, if you will, indicating that a that a Soviet ICBM attack was uh, uh, either imminent or had just been launched. And NORAD passed that to uh, Strategic Air Command, and they put. ICBMs on alert, interceptor aircraft were launched to intercept a possible Soviet attack. But like Petrov, the people who were involved in that went back and reviewed the system and cross-checked it with the uh, satellites that monitored or looked for Soviet launches. And by doing all of this cross-checking, they were able to determine that there was a glitch in the system, and uh, they were able to stand down. And that whole scenario did not go to uh, as far as the president. It was figured out before the, it got that far that it had been a glitch. My assumption is that the situation with Petrov was similar, that uh, it had reached his level. Uh, and he was a lieutenant colonel at the time, I understand, 
and he would have then reported it up the chain of command to uh, higher ranking officers because something like pushing the button would have been uh, there would be no authorization below the level of general for something like that there certainly wouldn't have been in the in the united states where it goes all the way to the president but it would have gone through a level of several levels of higher and higher ranking officers wanted to talk about this idea of mutual assured destruction and how that played into what prevented any nuclear attacks from ever being launched during the Cold War. You know, both sides were leery of each other, and both sides felt like it would be a bad idea to throw the first punch, I guess. I think that's absolutely true. They were leery of throwing the first punch, knowing that the, that a, that a second punch would come. Uh, mutual assured destruction, which has the uh, um, appropriate acronym MAD, MAD, was uh, that was a, a concept that was coined back in the in the 60s and the idea was that uh, we are assured of of destroying them but they are assured of destroying us in other words both sides have that, that the capability of obliterating the other and therefore that capability is a deterrent that prevents either side from deciding that they're going to launch an attack. What was it like politically to have diplomatic talks with the Soviet Union during this time when you know that you have missiles aimed at them, they have missiles aimed at you? How does that, I guess that's always like, you know, the big elephant in the room, hey, you know, we're, we've got our guns pointed at each other literally. Uh, how, how do you operate uh, as a diplomat under those types of tensions? Diplomatically, there had been the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty back in 1963. The Strategic Arms Limitation Talks had, had gotten underway in 1969, led to the uh, Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 1972. So there was a good deal of uh, diplomatic engagement during this period, and both sides were cognizant of this mutual assured destruction capability and neither side wanted to see that happen both sides were anxious to find some way of diffusing this situation short of war or short of of reducing their their own capability to the point where the other side would have some level of superiority so the, the talks were going on and i think that in the environment of mutual assured destruction which is uh, a terrible thing, an elephant in the room, as you uh, as you put it. There, there was a certain um, assurance that something bad was unlikely to happen because of because of the uh, mutual assured destruction. You sit down with somebody from a you know, in any negotiations, you sit down with somebody from a from uh, a position of strength or a position of weakness or a more or less uh, situation of parity. And um, as long as this parity existed, the two sides could negotiate. And, uh, oh, and as I said, it, um, there was the, uh, the nuclear test ban treaty in, in 1963 and then the, uh, the ABM treaty in 1972. Um, then there was, there was the, uh, the second round of... Uh, of uh, SALT talks, the Strategic Arms Limitation talks, um, which uh, got underway in the, immediately after the, uh, the ABM treaty and culminated in a, in a second agreement, SALT II, in 1979. So these things were ongoing throughout that period. And um, the... Um, the, the sort of nuclear stalemate that was provided by uh, this this sort of elephant in the room, I, I, it allowed neither side to uh, negotiate from a strength of weakness, or or a, I mean, of it allowed neither side to negotiate from a position of strength, nor a position of weakness, and uh, that allowed the the diplomats to do uh, do what they did. We should mention that in this case of uh, Petrov, 
He、uh, was neither promoted nor disciplined and continued his service while the story remained classified until 1998.、Uh, he said he was denied an award because the incident was investigated by the officers responsible for the malfunction. So, you know, he had to wait over 15 years, I guess, to to be recognized for this really heroic act, going against protocol and making sure that. Uh, a glitch was nothing more than a glitch, but now that you know we were, we're two decades on beyond、uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, I guess we're seeing more and more stories emerge from how close things came, and, and we're seeing more acts of heroism come to the surface by individuals. Is that something too on the American side that we see that there are individuals who were working tirelessly to keep things calm and to、uh, make sure things did not escalate? Well, I think I think that、uh, that's absolutely true. I, on neither side was there、uh, any real enthusiasm for、uh, starting a nuclear war, and、um, conversely, there was a great deal of、uh, interest in doing whatever is possible to make sure that、uh, that a nuclear war didn't start accidentally. And having said that, I think that um, um, it's. It was certainly、um, incumbent on both sides to、uh, keep any any incidents like this as secret as possible. In Petrov's case, as you point out, it was、uh, there were people above him on the chain of command who、uh, had bore some responsibility for the technical glitch, and and for for their own purposes, they obviously didn't want that to be to be made known, but.、Um, I don't think, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think either side、uh, really wanted to、um, to admit to these mistakes at the time.、Uh, I don't think they wanted、uh, anybody to really understand how how fragile the whole system was.、Um, certainly, the hero、uh, the heroism of、uh, of a Petrov one day could be、uh, balanced against.、Uh, The、uh, nervousness of, an, of another guy the next day, who, viewing the same information, would、uh, would recommend a counterstrike. It was a scary time for both sides, and I think to admit mistakes would allow the other side and the civilians in both countries and、uh, people in in other countries to have a have a look inside the process and see how. Fragile it was. That's Bill Yenny. He's an historian who's written numerous books on 20th century history, including Secret Weapons of the Cold War, from the H bomb to SDI. His latest book is The White Rose of Stalingrad. Bill Yenny, thanks again for talking with us. Thank you.